Uh, Dave DeBar, as he said, I work in the Office Product Group instead of the Artificial Intelligence and Research Group. Uh, long story as to how I got here for this tutorial. I'd be happy to share off camera over a beer sometime. Using CNTK's Python interface for deep learning is the title of our tutorial. CNTK is Microsoft's uh, cognitive toolkit, they call it. It uh, used to stand for, I believe, Computational Network Toolkit, but the, the names have changed, but the theme is still the same. The idea is to support these neural nets with multiple hidden layers for uh, uh, machine learning problems. If you want a copy of the slides, you can go to this uh, address, crossentropy.net slash pydata. If you want a copy of the notebooks, uh, they are also at the uh, same address. All right, and a little bit of a humor. What dropout called it deep learning hype instead of back propaganda? Uh, humorous take on, from ML Hipster and Naomi Safra. Topics to be covered during the uh, tutorial. Things that I, I said I would cover. Cognitive uh, toolkit installation, just to make sure you have an example that you've seen and it's been recorded and you can go over what went wrong here uh, in, case, in case things go wrong. You know, it's Microsoft. Generally speaking, installation goes pretty well, but you never know. <laughs> Why would you laugh at that? <laughs> uh, what is machine learning? We'll do a simple gradient descent example. Don't stress too much about the math. I'm just trying to expose you to things. Actually, this, the concepts that underlie this uh, uh, deep learning technology are actually extraordinarily simple. And there's a lot of variance on them, but sometimes you get people using different notations for, for the same stuff. Uh, what is learning representations? This is the core of uh, deep learning. We'll have a, an example of that. Why do graphics processing units help? We're not going to do this too much other than we're going to use graphics processing units and talk a little bit about why they help. How do we prevent overfitting? This is kind of a big deal in machine learning in general, where we uh, have a better, better fit to our training data than the the new unseen data that we want to operate and uh, operate with. CNTK packages and mod modules, just a brief uh, overview of what kinds of things are available in terms of, hey, we've got to set up a network, we've got to set up a, a learning algorithm, that sort of thing, parameters for those things. And uh, deep learning examples, including convolutional neural network and long short-term memory examples. This will be the, the core of the talk. This is where most of the, the notebooks come from. So uh, today, in terms of uh, data sets and notebooks, there will be two synthetic data sets. And out of those, we'll have three notebooks. The three notebooks will cover uh, uh, logistic regression and multi-layer perceptrons, just so you get exposure to what these things are, what people mean when they say these things. We will have uh, two image data set problems, two image data sets. Out of that, we will get uh, six notebooks. We'll have a logistic regression. We'll have an MLP notebook. We'll have several MLP notebooks, actually. And we'll have, uh, I should say, three. three multi-layer perceptron notebooks, and uh, two convolutional, convolutional neural network notebooks. And then we'll have five, uh, or uh, sorry, three text or three text problems. Let's give an overview of the data sets here. Oops. Three text problems, and from that we'll get five notebooks. There'll be an, a multi-layer perceptron just to ground ourselves back in the, hey, what, what are these neural network things about? There will be a convolutional neural network, just so we see how that's applied to text with uh, what they call word embeddings. We'll use global vectors. You could also use word to vec. We will have two notebooks for long short-term memory solutions, and we will have one final notebook or fast text. All right, so those are what we're going to cover in the next couple of hours. <clears throat> At least the, the level of laughter is going down, that's good. What is machine learning? All right, so how does Dave define machine learning? Dave defines machine learning as using data to create a model, and these are mathematical models, so there's gonna be a tiny little bit of math. Uh, to, to map uh, one or more input values to one or more output values. 
and this has interest from many groups, as you might imagine, and these people have uh, different names for the same things. So for example, the computer scientists call this uh, uh, machine learning, the statisticians call this statistical learning, the engineers call this pattern recognition, all the same stuff, same themes. Example applications, object detection, I can ask, hey, are there people in this image from an a, a unmanned aerial vehicle? Speech recognition, what is this person asking for when they respond to a, a, a voice menu system? Translation, machine translation, somebody, you could type an email, you could send it to somebody in a foreign country and uh, conceptually have it uh, automatically translate stuff for you. Natural language processing, we could track, for example, sentiment of, uh, of the tweets that we see on the internet, gesundheit, or the uh, um, postings that we see on uh, various social media platforms. Recommendations, what do we recommend? What kinds of uh, uh, movies would we recommend? What kinds of uh, other products might we recommend that you buy? What kind of news stories might you be interested in? Genomics, I remember when I was uh, younger, I, my, when my uh, child needed a tetanus shot, they asked me to sign a form that said, well, this might kill your child. <laughs> so I think uh, being able to have customized medicine is kind of super important. Advertising, uh, it's an awesome application where you automatically get labels, right? You, you have some pool of advertising that you can choose from to put on your website, and you get feedback from users about whether they're interested in it by the clicks. That you, that you see. Or uh, if they can go a step further and say, did this person actually sign up or did this person purchase whatever it was that was being advertised. Finance, we can ask uh, uh, things like, what uh, investments look profitable for the, next, for the near term? Security, we could ask, is this credit card transaction look like it was generated by Dave in uh, Anguilla, for example? Or does this look like uh, this is malware? Relationships between the things that we talk about here. So it's, uh, it's kind of like an onion, I guess. This is from this uh, uh, deep learning book by uh, Good, Goodfellow, Bengio, and Corville. It's a great book for, for theory, for uh, deep learning. And it's kind of it's, it's got some nifty uh, points for the high level aspects too. So in our onion, at the outer layer, we have artificial intelligence. An example here is knowledge bases, where you might have heuristic rules, expert rules that have been encoded into uh, uh, making decisions for you. The layer in, inside of that, a subset of artificial intelligence, machine learning. This is where we're trying to get build, automatically build models to map inputs to outputs. Example here that they mention are, uh, is logistic regression, others that you might think of random force or gradient boosting would be super popular versions of uh, machine learning today. Then on the one, one more layer in, we have representation learning. And here they talk about uh, shallow autoencoders. Autoencoder, for example, I, I try to predict my outputs. Whatever the inputs are to this multi-layer, simple multi-layer perceptron, I try to predict those inputs as outputs or uh, just a simple single hidden layer, multi-layer perceptron that we're gonna look at extensively kind of in the next uh, bit of time, uh, that this fits here, one layer. And then we have deep learning. It says example of MLPs. So MLPs are what are called feed forward networks, okay? A feed forward network with one layer you would call kind of a shallow learner. Uh, a feed, feed forward uh, network with multiple layers we refer to as a deep network. And some of these networks have well over 100 layers, right? So uh, one of the competition winners recently was a 151 layer network for image recognition. Uh, alternative to uh, feed forward networks are recurrent networks. So what is deep learning? Uh, same book. Here on the left, we have rule-based systems where we have some input data. We have a hand-designed program, some code encoding of heuristic rules, for example, expert rule system. And it, makes some, it generates some output. What advertisement should we display? The next uh, level over, this is kind of a, a redundancy of the uh, uh, previous slide, but classic machine learning, again, random forest, gradient boosting, logistic regression, we have input data, 
We'll see, again, we'll see examples of this with several data sets. They have hand-designed features. So typically this would come from uh, structured databases. You would have some kind of uh, uh, mapping from the features, which uh, is our, our model essentially, mapping the hand-designed hand features to output predictions. For example, class labels for uh, uh, classification. Is this uh, a malware or not? Or uh, numeric values for uh, regression. It, what will be the temperature tomorrow? All right, so under representation learning, again, representation learning is the big deal about uh, deep learning. <clears throat> so a lot of effort, a lot of money goes into this uh, business of uh, hand-designed features in machine learning historically. And the problem is that uh, for perceptual data, for example, uh, in computer vision, image Im object detection within images, or in uh, speech recognition, it's really hard to come up with uh, uh, great features. Although folks have, have made admirable, admirable efforts for sure. Uh, okay, so in the representation learning, here in the shallow version on the left here that I'm circling, we have input, some set of features comes in, we get a mapping from these features, we'll see an explicit example of this in a few minutes, and that's used to make some kind of prediction. In the deep learning version of it, we not only have that uh, 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 initial layer of mapping, we have mappings of mappings. We have uh, uh, features of features. We, we can make up multiple levels of abstraction. So I can say, for example, at one layer of a network, I could say, oh, do you see that kind of shape? And uh, the same la layer, uh, low level feature, I might ask, do you see this shape? And then at a higher level, I might ask, oh, do you see that shape? Maybe that's a cat ear, for example. All right, machine learning taxonomy, just so I've mentioned some of these things. Uh, supervised learning, this is where we're hanging out this morning for sure. Uh, output is provided for observations used for training. In the case of classification, the output is a categorical label. It belongs to this class, it doesn't belong to this class, for example. Our focus for today is what they call discriminative. We're not worried about uh, predicting the probability of observing this, this input data. Parametric models. So uh, parametric means we know the size of the model before we actually build the model. Unsupervised learning, uh, this, in this instance, uh, output is not provided for observations used for training. A great example of this is either dimensionality reduction, like some kind of uh, principal component analysis type thing we're not gonna talk about, or customer segmentation, some kind of clustering. Semi-supervised learning is kind of in between the uh, supervised and unsupervised learning uh, segments. Output is provided for some of the observations used for training. And then finally, and I, I should say that uh, unsu for unsupervised learning, typic uh, typically two purposes for unsupervised learning. One is to say, huh, what does the data look like? Can I get a, get a handle on what kinds of things are similar to other kinds of things in my data with the representation I have? And then, for example, if I have clustering output, I can turn that into features for my supervised training. Uh, reinforcement learning. So we're not going to talk about this one. We won't have an example of this today, but I think this will probably be a big deal in the future. So today they talk about, uh, uh, so re reinforcement learning. Rewards are provided to provide positive or negative reinforcement with exploration used to seek an optimal mapping from states to actions. So these states to actions you can think of as inputs to outputs, same kind of thing. What you see people talk about is uh, Go. You know, So we've got a deep learning solution for Go. Uh, but this business of exploration, we've got a bunch of choices and we want, we'd like the computer to help us to see, are we missing something? Could we provide, be providing other alternatives to our customers that we're not currently doing? Uh, and can we do that in an intelligent way? I think this will be a big area for uh, uh, deep learning, actually machine learning in general in the future. All right, so a word or two about tensors, good times. Uh, so this says it's background. This is a little bit about linear algebra. So the two kinds of, uh, I think that you could search for uh, math for machine learning. And there's a couple of, couple of nice tutorials that gives you a little bit of background. The kinds of math that you might see here are calculus and linear algebra. And I guess I should also add statistics. Those are the three big, areas. 
Hello. <clears throat> All right, so tensor is just, uh, uh, I'm just giving a bit of terminology that people use here. Tensor is just a generalization of an array, right? So a scalar is just some number, 1.2. Aha, that is a scalar value. A vector is just an array of one-dimensional num uh, uh, numbers. So 1.2, 2.3, 3.4, that is a vector. A matrix is a two-dimensional array of numbers. So I could have 4.5, 5.6, 6.7, you get the idea. <clears throat> that is a two-dimensional array of numbers. A tensor is just a generalization of this, right? So you could refer to the others as, as tensors. So for a scalar, you'd say it's a zero-dimensional tensor. For a vector, you'd say it's a one-dimensional tensor. For a matrix, you'd say it's a two-dimensional tensor. Uh, tensors that, you know, a generalization that goes to more, more than two dimensions, examples here are arrays of images. So let's say we have an image with uh, an array of images with uh, red, green, and blue channels. So that's like three matrixy, matrices to stack on top of each other. Uh, array of documents with each word represented by an embedding. We'll look at an example of that in just a few minutes. And one last uh, uh, word of terminology because this is like, a, I think this is kind of at the core of deep learning. This is just Dave's take on this, right? Your mileage may vary on everything I say today, just so you know. <clears throat> uh, a word to shoot about dot products. So this dot product is just us measuring similarity. So we have two vectors, for example, 1.2, 2.3, 3.4, and uh, uh, 4.5, 5.6, 6.7. Those are two different vectors. And I can take and uh, uh, sum the products of these two. So I can multiply 1 by 1.2 by 4.5, add that to 2.3 plus or times 5.6, add that to 3.4 times 6.7. Why do people do such a thing? What's the big deal about a uh, uh, dot product, right? This is a specialized version of inner product, <clears throat> which is just a generalization of dot product. Um, this measures similarity between vectors. So when we talk about rolling things like a, a filter, a convolutional uh, neural network layer filter across an image, we're looking for a particular pattern. And we say, do you see it? Do you see it? Do you see it? Do you see it? <clears throat> we're using something like a dot product to do such a thing. All right, so dot product measures similarity between two vectors. The dot product is an unnormalized version of the cosine of the angle between two vectors where the cosine takes on the maximum value of plus one if the positive one, if the two vectors point in the same direction or the cosine takes on the minimum value of negative one if they point in the opposite directions. And we'll look at an explicit example of this in a few minutes that uh, hopefully should make it a lot clearer. <clears throat> Getting access to a platform with a graphics processing unit. Uh, graphics processing units often increase the speed of tensor manipulation by an order of magnitude. Sometimes less, for sure, but Significantly, you'll notice the difference if you use a GPU versus a, a, a central processing unit core. Uh, and this is because deep learning consists of easily parallelized operations like matrix multiplication. Matrix multiplication, you can think of as just a boatload of dot products. <laughs> uh, so GPUs often have thousands of processors, but they can be kind of expensive. So this is the option we're going to look at this morning. If you're just playing for a few hours, Azure is probably your best bet. Uh, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to rent someone else's GPU for like 90 cents an hour. Alternative, if you're a recurring hobby hobbyist or uh, you're a professional, you probably should consider buying a card. Uh, the differences between these cards are come in versions of core and memory. Uh, examples here are a GTX 1050 uh, Ti. You can get, uh, have 768 cores has four gigabytes of memory. It costs like $150. You can go down to Best Buy today, probably, <laughs> find it there and uh, just stick it in a PCI slot in your computer, away you go. It's, um, it's a relatively uh, inexpensive way to go. No special power requirements for the 1050 Ti, just plug in and play. For 1070 or 1080 Ti, uh, they're a little bit bigger card. They consume a little bit more power. So sometimes these things consume up to 150 watts of power, right, or more. And when they start consuming so much power, they generate a lot of heat. And when they generate a lot of heat, 
not only will you have extra power connectors, but you'll also have uh, uh, extra uh, uh, fan or extra cooling components to, to deal with when you do the installation. So just things to be aware of. And then uh, if you got the money, Titan XP, XP is probably the way to go if you, uh, today. 3,840 cores, 12 gigabytes of memory, uh, but $1,200. I don't think you'll find that one at the uh, Best Buy. All right, again, we'll cover uh, Azure VM here, virtual machine here. Do not forget to delete it when you're done. Those people would just keep charging you 90 cents an hour whether you're using the thing or not, right? All right, so if you are uh, uh, going to install your own card, for example, go down and buy one of these for like $700. Uh, this fits in, again, it fits in the uh, PCI slot. Here's a, a link to the, the user guide. For the card that you're considering, probably should look at the user guide before and open up your machine and look before you uh, uh, go purchase. But keep in mind, again, fancier cards require extra power slots. So here, it requires not only one, but two different uh, uh, power connectors, an eight pin and a six pin connector. Just something to keep in mind. All right, so for Azure, here is a uh, uh, pricing details for Azure. Uh, for an NC6 Ubuntu instance, it's 90 cents an hour. And that's what I'm using here. It's everything that I, I do here. It's about using the Ubuntu NC6 instance. It's like our lowest level instance, but it comes with a, a NVIDIA K80 card, which actually comes with two different graphic processing units and you get to use one of them for uh, 80 cents an hour. <laughs> if you go with the Windows version, it, this works on Windows too, uh, but if you go with the Windows version, it's like $1.08 an hour, right? And so it's like an 18 cents difference, whatever. Okay, so Azure sign in, you're going to create an account. You go to uh, this portal azure.com thing down here. When you log in, you're going to get uh, uh, an interface that looks like this for your dashboard. You're going to click on this virtual machines link. In the virtual machines link, you're going to click create virtual machine. These are super simple instructions. Under, uh, uh, once you've clicked that, you have presented with this, we're gonna click Ubuntu server. When we click Ubuntu server, we're going to click Ubuntu server 16.04 LTS. LTS stands for long-term support. It's probably the way to go. <clears throat> so, uh, we're going, to, it gives us this window and we're just going to select the resource default, resource manager deployment mode. When in doubt, use the default create. Click the create button. So here, I give a name for the computer, dadabar-azure. I say we want to use virtual machine disk type hard disk drive. I think, I think if you use the solid state drive, it will not let you select an NC6 instance. So, something to think about. <laughs> Do I have a good reason for that? No, I don't have a good reason for that. Uh, username. I just use my own name, you can use whatever. Authentication type here, I just use password. I would probably recommend if, you, if it's your own device, right, your own personal device that you're going to be using to access this thing, I would probably recommend going through a little bit of pain with the, the sec, uh, secure shell SSH setup because it just automatically logs you in. It just trusts that, aha, this must be Dave because this, this guy's authenticated this computer. We'll just use this stored SSH certificate to, to do the login. All right, so I set up a password on this. I confirmed my password. Uh, subscription. You can get like a $200 free trial, but to the best of my knowledge, you can't get a, a GPU instance on the free trial. I actually have no real re reason for that other than maybe it's a scarcity issue, right? Uh, so you have to select pay as you go if you want to, I think, if you want to uh, uh, set up a, a uh, GPU instance, VM. All right, so create new, it says a, a resource group. Sure, let's call it Dada Bar Resource Group, Da for Dave. Uh, and location, US West 2, or West US 2. I think uh, US East and US South Central also ha allow for GPU instances. If you're in doubt, you go to this regions thing here, and it will tell you which regions support GPU instances. All right, <clears throat> so we click create. Uh, we click OK here for the configure the virtual machine. 
it gives us an option that says, do you want a, a D1 V2 or an A1 instance? And I go, neither of those. So I click the view all button here on the right. This, I scroll down here. So we've scrolled down to the NC stuff. And I choose an NC6 instance. And this has given you the monthly rate. Don't panic, it, go, it charges by hour. <clears throat> all right, so NC6 standard. Uh, has six cores, six uh, CPU cores. It has 56 gigabytes of memory. It has uh, eight data disks, eight by fi 500 maximum IO operations per second, 338 uh, gigabytes uh, local SSD. Interesting. Load balancing. And one K80 graphics card. That's actually gives you like a half of a K80 graphics card, but whatever. <clears throat> Uh, configure, configure settings. So all, here, I touch nothing. I, I literally just went with the defaults. And again, if in doubt, just go with the defaults. All right, and then it gives you a summary of what you're about to purchase, and you click OK. So once it's, it takes maybe, I don't know, two or three minutes to deploy, give it up to 10 minutes. If it's still going after 10 minutes, hmm, Maybe refresh the screen. I've never had it go that long. Uh, so two or three minutes, it comes back with this interface saying we've deployed your VM. And this is the IP address of that thing. You can actually configure a domain name if you want for such a thing. We're not going to do that today. So literally, I just use uh, IP this uh, IP address to connect to my Azure VM. All right, so install, installing support software. So once we have... Uh, uh, Ubuntu VM set up. We log in with the password that we were given. Uh, there is support software installation directions here. Install CUDA drivers for NC VMs from the, the Microsoft folks. Uh, to get to the server, I use PuTTY. So everything that you see um, was generated by, by initially logging in with PuTTY which gives us secure shell so software. Uh, this is optional. If you already have a secure shell client, great, just use that. Uh, here's a place where you can download it from. When using SSH, make sure I would recommend that you, uh, uh, from the connection configuration option, under SSH and X11, make sure you check the little box that says enable X11 forwarding. This lets you have X window display, for example. I'm using a, a Windows laptop, right? I use a Windows Surface all the time. Uh, even when I'm connecting to my, my computers downstairs at home. Uh, so I, I just use an X window server, this X Ming X window server, uh, on my Windows laptop and project the, the graphics back using uh, X11. Okay. Configuring the NVIDIA driver. These are literally the commands to use. So we're going to grab this uh, uh, CUDA. CUDA stands for, it's an NVIDIA thing, uh, Compute Unified Device Architecture. We're setting up drivers for the graphics processing card. NVIDIA is the big winner here. Could you, do, uh, could you make use of GPUs from other customers, other uh, companies? Absolutely, but NVIDIA is the big, big name in, uh, today in deep learning. All right, so. Uh, this tells us the name of the package that we're looking for. <coughs> this is us going and fetching that package. Uh, this is us uh, installing the package. This is us removing <laughs> just extra bits, whatever, you can leave that. And this is us uh, uh, doing updates. So this tells it to update the servers where it gets software from. This tells it to install the CUDA drivers, and this tells us to install the CUDA support software. When you're done, after you issue, literally, I just typed those commands, or actually I, I copied, it, copied them from the slide and pasted them into my uh, uh, putty window here. So I'm pretty certain those are the commands. Uh, you should be able to run this NVIDIA-SMI at your command prompt, and you'll get something that looks like this. And this says you've got a access to a Tesla K80, and uh, it says you have 12 gigabytes of memory. Technically, uh, each of those process, each of the GPU units that come with the K80 has 12 gigabytes, so together it'd be 24, but you've got half of that. All right, so NC, uh, yeah, okay. And there's a, a link to the, 
the specs for the card if you want. That one costs a, a good bit more even than the Titan XP, so you have to break out your piggy bank. All right, so where to start with the machine learning stuff? Uh, logistic regression tutorial example. This, uh, this picture comes from the Cortana Intelligence Library gallery. They've got a collection of uh, cognitive tool toolkit tutorials, and I just thought it was a nice picture to give an idea of inputs, outputs, um, for simple example for logistic regression. And so did they, that's probably why they put it there. So over here on the horizontal axis, we have age and years of a person. Here on the vertical axis, we have tumor size in centimeters. So somebody's taken some kind of measurement, right, of the widest possible uh, measure, for example, of a, of a tumor, some kind of bump, right? And we've plotted these points. So those are two dimensions. The third dimension is color here. So the red dots represent uh, a positive class, malignant tumor, and the blue dot represents uh, um, uh, the negative class or benign tumor, okay? So here they've drawn this green line. This is essentially a logistic regression model, a decision boundary that says, if you're uh, in this region, we think you're a positive class. And if we look at that, we see like 10 out of 12 observations or like 83% uh, 83 of the examples over here are indeed positive class. And if you fall in this region, we think you are negative class or benign benign tumor. So that was just a simple example of a picture they, they drew. Uh, we will look at some synthetic data in here in a second. All right, so logistic regression is a shallow linear model, uh, a line, right? So our, our decision boundary is drawn by, classification boundary is drawn by a line. It consists of a single layer with a single sigmoid activation function, a sigmoid, gesundheit, sigmoid activation function maps log odds values to predicted probabilities. It has kind of an S shape. That's how it got the, the name sigmoid. Uh, cross entropy is used as a loss function, the objective used to, dri to drive training or updating the weights, right? How do we know, how do we build the model? We'll be using uh, stochastic gradient descent in our example today because this is the core learning method used for de uh, training deep learning models. But most logistic regression packages use uh, another method, right? They use what's called uh, uh, LBFGS, Limited Memory Broyden Fletcher Goldfarb Shano Optimization. It's an approximation of iteratively related least squares, but it has this bit where you have to, uh, so iteratively related least squares, the downside to it is it's got this bit where you have to invert a matrix, which is kind of a costly thing. And the larger the, the, the feature space, the, the more of a problem that's going to become. So, almost exclusively, stochastic gradient descents are our bit, are a best bet, or a variant of it. Logistic regression model. Sigmoid functions use map uh, input features to a predicted probability of class membership. Here we have an example. This is our predicted probability p hat. Uh, one over one plus exp negative, negative uh, x transpose w. This x is some input vector. This w is some weight vector. And this is just the dot product of those two things, right? How similar is this, is this input vector pointing in the same direction as our uh, weight vector. So here, this would be the weight vector for this, this classification problem. It would be pointing in this direction. And so you're asking, are anything that points in the same direction as this uh, weight vector, it's positive class. Anything that points in the opposite direction, it's the negative class, okay? All right, uh, and there's words that just say the same thing, I think. All right, so learning by gradient descent. The gradient of the loss functions used to update the weights of the model. We'll look at an implementation in Python, of course. Uh, the gradient of the loss function tells us how to maximize the loss function. Yes, I, I said maximize. Seems like we'd want to minimize the loss function. Uh, so we're going to take the negative of the gradient or just subtract off the gradient to minimize the loss function. Cross entropy loss function. This is the most popular thing for uh, classification today in deep learning. This function is used to measure dissimilarity between two distributions in the context of evaluating pattern recognition models or uh, pattern recognition is another name for classification models. We are using this function to measure the dissimilarity of the target class indicator and predicted probability for each class. So here we have our predicted probabilities and here we have an indicator of whether it actually belongs to that class over 
the classes, and the observations in your data set. So this sum negated, of course, because otherwise it would be going up, right? <laughs> uh, the negated version of that sum is log loss, or uh, another name for that is cross entropy. All right, so gradient descent for logistic regression. Uh, here are some nasty math symbols. We won't spend too much time with this. It's got the little Jolly Roger there in the, the lower left-hand corner. Uh, cross, en cross entropy function, the function used for evaluating the quality of a prediction can be expressed as follows. So we say this negative log probability of it belongs to this class given our input data, x, and our model, weight, weight vector w. This can be translated to this. These two are equivalent. Uh, so literally, this is our predicted probability. If it uh, uh, belongs to that class, y sub i star is 1. And this is the probabil predicted probability, or 1 minus the probability of positive class membership, if it does not belong to this class. So only one of these two, y sub i star or 1 minus y sub i star, only one of those two is going to be 1. The other will drop to 0, which is effectively removes that uh, term. All right, uh, so this becomes is the same as thing as this, which is the same thing as this. Here we're just saying, ah, oh, you know what? This to the minus 1, I can just pull out the minus 1, and it cancels that thing out. And so this is, this is the loss function we'll be working with in practice. So y sub i star is 0, 1. y sub i is negative 1, 1 in the next four slides. All right, gradient descent uh, part two. Derivative of the loss function with respect to a parameter indicates how to optimize the, uh, the weight to optimize the loss function. This is our uh, gradient symbol. This is the gradient of this loss function with respect to our weight vector w the weights we want to update, our model. This is the, uh, it's a vector of partial derivatives, right? Partial derivatives with each of the weights in our model. So for example, in the two dimensions, we'd have a weight for each dimension plus a bias term. Uh, the machine learns, quote unquote, by updating the model to minimize the, the loss function. All right, so we update by uh, subtracting the product of the input feature value and the difference between the predicted probability and the class membership indicator. And what this is, this is uh, harkens back to the chain rule from calculus. But essentially, it's, this is uh, our predicted probability, p hat, minus the indicator, whether it belonged to this class or didn't belong to this class. It was malignant or is benign, right? One or zero. And this is the actual input data. So the product of, of this difference and the input data tells us how to update a weight in our model. And this is true uh, in general for our deep learning. All right, uh, showing steps of differentiation for completeness. Yeah, 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 look at that over, your, over on your own. Uh, email me if you got questions. Oh, oh, by the way, so I ripped this off from uh, derivativecalculator.net, right? So most, you know, most of you probably don't do this day to day, otherwise you probably wouldn't be in the room, I don't know. Um, but, uh, so if I, want to, if I want to develop some new super cool loss function, right? for my uh, graduate work or something, then uh, I, can, I can feed my loss function into something like uh, derivativecalculator.net to find out what derivative would I use to update my weights. All right, so logistic regression example as a network, uh, viewed as a network, there is a simple input layer of pre-processed features and there is an output layer with a sigmoid activation function. So literally, we're going to take the dot products of uh, uh, this input vector and some weight vector here, and feed that through our uh, uh, logistic function to get an estimated probability of positive class membership. So, this is our first example, stochastic gradient descent in Python. Uh, to fire up the Jupyter Notebook, you download Anaconda, you type in dollar home Anaconda 3 bin Jupyter space notebook, it'll come up with a, a list of uh, uh, notebooks for you, you select 01 SGD, like so. All right, so uh, in block one here, so each of these things, right, we have some blocks of, actually there's just a block at the top that gives a name to the notebook. 
uh, just a, a simple markdown expression that says what, what this notebook is about. So the first one is simple stochastic gradient descent. Uh, line one from block one. Uh, initialization, import numpy as mp from matplotlib, import pyplot as plt. This allows us to do some visualization. Uh, percent matplotlib in line allows us to uh, do the visualization inside the notebook. mp random seed makes the, thing, makes the stuff repeatable. All right, so block two, we're going to generate some data. Uh, so there's going to be, uh, in this numpy concatenate, we're going to generate two different classes of data. Normal, both are multivariate normal, essentially just two dimensions down here, right, where I have uh, in the upper right-hand corner, I have the positive class, the red Xs, and in the uh, lower left-hand corner, I have the uh, negative class, or the blue Xs. So our uh, uh, negative class is centered at negative three, negative three, over here on our coordinates. And it has a, uh, we're using essentially what's called an identity matrix for our uh, covariance, right? So it just says it has a unit, uh, a single unit standard deviation in both directions. Uh, okay. And then uh, we generate 10 points for the negative class and our positive class is centered at three, three. So three, three. And we generate another 10 with the same identity matrix for, for covariance. All right, so we uh, make a y vector of 10 zeros and 10 ones for the negative class and the positive class labels. We plot them just to get a picture of, of what they look like. We have uh, uh, here, I'm initializing the array manually. Typically you would do this via uh, uh, ran uh, randomly initialized to small values. Here I'm initializing to negative 0.02, negative 0.01, and zero and I'm printing the vector just so you can see. This is actually pointed in the wrong direction. So our class here would actually be along this line, right, between the two classes. This is where our decision boundary would lie. And our uh, uh, weight vector should actually be pointing in this direction, pointing in the same direction as the positive class, okay? So by giving it something that starts off with negative numbers here, I'm actually pointing it in the wrong direction. We want to see, can it overcome it? All right, uh, predict probability. This is that uh, sigmoid function, one over one plus EXP negative, uh, EXP is just Euler's number, 2.71828. Uh, dot product between our input values and our weight vector. And so P is our predicted probabilities for those uh, uh, data that we just generated taking in our in inputs, our uh, data, and our weight vector. And here we're pr pr printing the predicted probabilities. So for the first 10 observations, which are the negative class, we see, huh, it actually is above 0.5. And for the next 10, we see it's below 0.5. And that's because the weight vector is pointed in the wrong direction. <laughs> All right, so uh, some weight update, uh, a simple weight up update example. So here we are. With uh, J is one, this is just us, um, this is just us saying which index to use from our data set. I'm just using uh, one, I could have used zero, whatever. So print the, print the out, uh, input values, negative two, negative point, negative four. Uh, I print the output value, which is zero, the actual class membership value, which is zero print the weight vector, which is the same thing we initialized it to. I predict, uh, print the predicted probability, which is above 0.5, which is wrong, of course. I print, in, uh, print uh, compute gradient. The gradient here, as we mentioned before, is just our prediction. Oops. It's just our prediction, one over one plus exp negative dot product between the input and the weight vector minus the actual class indicator, zero or one, times the input values. All right, so this is me printing the, the computed gradient. This is me printing the updated uh, weight vector, w minus the computed gradient. And this is me uh, uh, printing the predicted probability with that updated weight vector using w minus compute gradient. 
and we see that our, our predicted probability at the end of that is zero. Did the right thing, right? All right, so uh, learning rate 0.5, epochs 5,000. Epoch is just an iteration through the entire data set. We only have 20 observations. Uh, index, uh, here I'm just building an index of, uh, for the observations, and then I'm shuffling that index to do, this is the stochastic part of gradient descent, randomly selecting one observation at a time. Okay. For each of the observations, we just, we're doing updates to the weight vector. Okay. So we're rolling through the data, doing updates to the weight vector. This is me generating the predicted probabilities, and this is me printing out the epoch, the iteration through the data, the loss function, the, the log loss, as well as the uh, uh, weight vector. So here we start off with zero, with our uh, a log loss of 0.016, and our weight vector is 0.921.14. .1 and by the end of 1,000 epochs, we get down to uh, 49.99. We uh, have five zeros after the decimal point, e negative, point o, uh, e negative 06. Uh, so 0.00009127. The cool, interesting thing to note about this is it keeps going down over here, okay? And the reason it keeps going down is because our weights keep getting larger. Because the uh, log loss that we're feeding into our uh, uh, sigmoid, uh, or excuse me, our um, uh, weights, yeah, our log odds that we're feeding into the sigmoid function are uh, continually growing which is gonna cause us a problem in terms of overfitting. I had a question about the shuffle part. I'm okay. guessing you did that because it's a cast gradient instead of not batch, right? Right. If you did mini batch, <clears throat> would you have to also shuffle it? Uh, no, you should wind up with the same, same answer because you're gonna go through all the data. Um, in, okay, so there's three variants, right? Right. There's uh, a stochastic gradient descent proper, where you do them one at a time. There is a uh, batch gradient descent where you're doing them all. Doesn't matter because the the, the uh, product of the differences between the predictions because the weight were, weights were frozen before you started this iteration with the batch gradient descent. Uh, so the differences, it doesn't matter which order you process them in because it'll still be the same weight vector that you started on the, the epoch with. Uh, so, the, and the input values will still be the same. So the, the sum of those things is still the same. But if you're doing mini batch with like batches of like 128. Yes, then it matters. Yep. Okay. All right. Um, all right. So our weights grow. Our weights will continue to grow if we don't regularize them. All right. So what do we mean by regularization of stochastic gradient descent? So computing regularized loss. Uh, here, we're going to add this extra term for the loss. We're going to add a half times some weight decay rate parameter times the squared weights, okay? And you notice that I, I have uh, of two of my three entries in my weight vector here. I have uh, uh, the weights for the, both of the inputs, but not the bias term. The bias term is not regularized typically. I have not seen anybody do that in an implementation. But the idea here is that uh, by taking the gradient of that, of that weight component, right, where we're adding this, the squared weights to our loss value, uh, by taking the, the, and subtracting the gradient of that thing, essentially we're just saying, take a small proportion of the weight and move it closer to zero. Whatever weight you have, let's move it a little bit closer to zero. If it was a negative weight, a little towards zero. If it was a positive weight, a little towards zero. Subtracting off or adding off as appropriate. And so what we wind up here with the regularized version, after 5,000, after actually, oh, let's say 1,000 iterations. How many iterations did I have? 5,000, something like this. Uh, 5,000 epochs. After 1,000 iterations, we're, we're pretty much uh, uh, got our final vector, right? So 1.3, 1.3 uh, for the first uh, uh, input, 1.0 for the second, and negative 0.5 for the bias. And it stays the same all throughout. And the idea behind the regularization, oops.
It's thinking. Adding a page here. Uh, let's say that we had instead of uh, of linearly separable classes, we had this situation where there's a little bit of overlap. So rarely we see an observation that crosses over the line. What we don't want to have happen is our weights to grow to infinity, because that'll continue to, to minimize that log loss if it's left unchecked, <clears throat> and have a value where it's just on this side of the line, then, oh yes, that's definitely a negative class over here. But if it crosses just a little bit over, it says, oh, times positive infinity, oh, that's definitely positive. We don't want a small change in inputs to lead to a large change in outputs. That's a, a typical behavior that we see associated with uh, what they call overfitting. All right, so um, going through st uh, stratifying gradient descent, as we mentioned earlier, stochastic gradient descent one, one at a time, batch gradient descent, all of them at the same time. Mini batch is a popular thing. It's actually the most popular thing. Uh, some set at a time, right? So 64 observations at a time, 128 observations at a time, that sort of thing. Um, gradient descent can also be stratified by a couple other, uh, along a couple other dimensions. There could be a, uh, a momentum term. The idea here is to take uh, advantage of the fact that uh, uh, the surface, the decision surface that we're, or the surface that we're, we're climbing down for minimizing our loss function isn't the same along all dimensions. So maybe some dimensions we want to travel faster than others. Uh, uh, so with the, um, okay, so I'm sorry, that's adaptive gradients. Adaptive gradients. There's a version of adaptive gradients. Adaptive gradients not used so much. There's a, a sm slightly better version of this called root mean square propagation. So this is a form of adaptive gradients with normalization of the gradients. Momentum is uh, a way of us uh, avoiding, hopefully avoiding local minima because in deep learning, there is no such thing as a convex uh, loss surface. So there's lots of little bumps, right? And what we're doing is hoping for a, a relatively good bump, right? That we get in a relatively low loss situation. The momentum, the idea is to use the, the previous updates, a weighted combination of the current gradient plus the, the previous gradients to uh, keep traveling in the same kind of direction and hope, hope of uh, avoiding local minima if possible to get to uh, a global optima. All right, multi-layer perceptron example. Here we have just three layers, uh, input layer, a hidden layer, and output layer. Um, so these guys themselves can be sigmoids. So this is a sigmoid, this is a sigmoid, this is an, uh, a sigmoid. All right, so here is our, our same network, same little network that we looked at. Here I've defined the sigvoid function, one over one plus exp negative x. Here I have a, a, a bias, input one, input two. A bias is always one, right? It's just an extra term to add, a, 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 to change the output value um, that's being fed into some activation function like uh, a sigmoid. Bias term. Input one and input two terms and a target. This says this is a positive class observation with uh, uh, the x value being one, the first dimension being one, value being one, the second dimension value being negative one. Here is us, uh, here is definition of a network here where we have, oops. This first block is weights for that 
first hidden layer neuron. The second block, lines six through eight, are weights for the second hidden layer neuron. And this final is the weights for the uh, output neuron. Okay, all three of these are going to be sigmoid activation functions. All right, so forward propagation of input uh, features through the data, if we wanted to manually step through, we're just doing dot products, right? Dot product of uh, the first line, line two there, dot product of the input values, one, negative one, with our uh, uh, hidden weights, hidden layer weight, hidden uh, node one activation uh, or weights, hidden layer node one weights. And then the activation of hidden, hidden layer one node is uh, just the sigmoid of that dot product. Same thing for four and five for that second, second uh, um, node. Here's us printing the two activation outputs. Block five here is us doing the uh, activation between the two hidden layer nodes. So with the line two there is the dot product of the two, uh, of the two features from the hidden layer plus the activation output. And then uh, line six here, or block six rather, is us updating the uh, uh, weights for the output layer, okay? I think that uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to start going a little bit faster, but the idea is that we're applying the gradients to these things, okay? So we take the derivative as a loss and the derivative of the output activation function I'm cop eight, line seven, eight, I'm copying off the uh, previous weight values to store them. I'll need those in a minute to, to back propagate some data. And then in, uh, I'm updating the weights for the output neuron in lines 10 through 12. And here, here are us printing the updated weights. So I, I, I updated them to be funky, right? A little bit, uh, so my initialization was 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.03, 0.04, et cetera. And what I see here is, in, in the case of the three weights here, it was uh, uh, 0 0.07, 0 0.08, 0 0.09. In, in this case, it's increased all three weights, which is the right thing because it's going to increase the uh, activation out for the uh, uh, sigmoid. Because uh, we want it to, be, to say that it's positive class membership. All right, so uh, here is us back propagating error using derivatives from the hidden layer. And these derivatives, there's an appendix uh, sl uh, slide for our deck that gives the der derivation of this uh, P times one minus P being our uh, derivative of act activation. Here is us updating the weights for the hidden, uh, first hidden layer, our first hidden layer node. And here is us uh, updating the weights for the second hidden layer node and printing out the weights. And what we see is uh, the weights that increased are the positive things. The, so the bias term increased, the uh, um, positive input value, the weight for that increased, the negative input value, it decreased. By decreasing that, we're taking a, a step towards saying, you know what, let's have a little bit more positive output for this activation function which actually turns out to be the right thing. And that happens for the second hidden layer neuron as well. All right, and so then we check our prediction. Here's us doing the forward propagation again. And now we get, in, instead of uh, originally, our prediction was, uh, originally our predicted output was um, 0.538. It is now 0.542. So we're moving in the right direction because this is a positive class uh, uh, observation. Uh, 0.542 is better than 0.538 in terms of our, our loss function. Our predicted probability of uh, positive class membership is, is in fact larger. We have learned something. All right. Back propagation description. This thing we're not going to spend time on, but again, uh, from a theoretical perspective, this deep learning book, awesome. It, it, everybody, every, it takes everybody a long time to read through such a thing. Don't, uh, don't panic. The best bet, uh, if you're doing this on your own, is to try to, get your, uh, try to convince your friends to join a reading group, right? So that you can go through the misery together. If you're reading 10 pages a day, um, 
don't sweat it. I mean, that seriously is it's totally awesome, actually. Right? If you're reading uh, more than 10 pages a day out of the book, you've probably done this for a while then. All right, so installing CNTK. So we installed NVIDIA drivers earlier. Now we're going to start using CNTK in our final hour here. All right, so here I am just using the stuff from setup Linux binary manual. I sudo apt-get install open MPI bin, uh, message passing interface binary. I get the Anaconda 34.1.1 installation. I got this one because this one, this page says this is the version they tested with. Probably want to go with the version they tested with. Actually, this stuff's relatively stable, I think. You probably actually know better than I do. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm just playing it safe. I'm going with the version they say they used. We install that one, right? So here is me calling bin bash with this uh, .sh that I downloaded to install Anaconda. This is the, the responses I get. You know, basically I'm just pressing enter to go through, right? Um, let's read the license. Let's scroll through the license. Let's enter yes that we accept the licensing terms. It's a personal decision. Uh, press enter to uh, take the default inst installation directory. I did that. And enter yes to prepend Python to your program search path so that you don't have to keep playing. Oh, where's Python? Uh, here is us actually installing CNTK. So literally, I am using version 3.5. And this page says these two guys go together. So I'm just using this WHL file, wheel file to, uh, with pip to, to do the installation. All this stuff is super quick. Uh, the reason why I didn't want to do it with you today is because I was worried that uh, so many people with uh, all of us on the Wi-Fi cause problems, who knows. Anyways, uh, and here I'm installing a browser because I'm going to point it back to my um, uh, instance at home on my Windows uh, surface. All right, so MLP example with N CNTK. Now we're going to start rolling through things. Now we're going to start doing high-level stuff. All right, so here is us uh, importing CNTK as C. So it's just a namespace, right? Cogn uh, cognitive Toolkit namespace. Matplotlib because we want to visualize stuff, right? And NumPy and seed so we get uh, some, some uh, repeatability. Here I've made a separate, uh, a different data set. Uh, so here we have our positive class is the reds, right? Over here centered at negative uh, three, three. And negative um, three, three, and three, negative three. So our red, our two red X groups are our positive class, and our two blue X groups are our negative class. And now where's your linear deity, right? There's no way to actually get a single line to, to separate those guys, those two classes. So this is what representation learning is all about. We want to, to have the computer tell us what features. If, if we were hiring people, right, probably what you would do is spend, spend some money. Domain experts would get together and they would, they would look at this and go, oh, you know what? We can, say, we can multiply, we can take the interaction of this first feature and the second feature. We just multiply them together, right? If it's negative one, it's positive class, if it's positive one, it's negative class. It's simple, but we had to hire somebody to do the feature engineering for us. What we'd like to get is the, the computer to do some feature engineering for us. All right, so here is me uh, uh, declaring the input feature count is two, the output class count is two. Here is me declaring a couple of uh, operands, input variables, uh, input uh, based on the input feature count, an input variable, based on the output feature count, a label variable class label variable, does it belong to positive or negative class. Here is us declaring the model. Hidden feature count, we're gonna have two. Uh, that same, the same uh, uh, pretty back propagation network that we looked at just a second ago, this is precisely the network we're defining, okay? All right, so uh, sequential network consisting of two layers, two dense layers. Uh, lines three and four here. The first dense layer has hidden feature count, two, two nodes, and we are initializing using this uh, um, 
again, we're using the layers package from Cognitive Toolkit. Uh, Glowrot Uniform. Glowrot just said, you know what, we should have distribution with uh, uh, a mean of zero, but our variance should be relatively small. It should be based on the size of our network layer. All right, now size of the network layers. Uh, so based on this guy's heuristic, Glorot's heuristic, we're going to use a uniform distribution with Glorot's heuristic to initialize these as small values, really small values. Um, actually, it's not such a, such a large network, so maybe it's not so, so small, but you, know, you get the idea. 0 0.01, 0 0.02, that kind of thing. <coughs> uh, activation, we're going to use the sigmoid that we know and love from, from earlier. And we're going to call this hidden layer so we can actually access the, the um, weights from it later. Otherwise, I, don't, I never name these things. Okay. We're going to define a second dense layer here on line four. Output class count, also two. So here, for uh, it's going to have two output nodes. Essentially, we're using uh, softmax, which is... Uh, um, So our activation value that we used earlier was this. Actually, it was uh, X transpose weight. <clears throat> but this sigmoid activation function is equivalent of this softmax activation function. These two guys are the same. When you talk about difficulty of reading people's papers and things, I remember in the 90s, uh, some guy had used this without the half, so he started using two here, and I'm like, how did he get a two? Uh, so x transpose w, x transpose w, you get the idea. Um, <clears throat> these two are equivalent, except one has one node, the other has two nodes. All right. So we're using the softmax, and our network is parameterized by input. It's an, uh, that is the input for our, our network function. Our loss, we're going to declare from the losses library, or losses package, rather. Cross entropy with softmax. We know what cross entropy is. Our metrics, we're going to use classification error. What proportion of things did you get wrong? Learning rate, we're going to use a, that's a relatively high learning rate. This is of the step, we're taking a step in the direction of the gradient. This says, how large should our step be? 0.5 is kind of large-ish, but we'll, we'll go with it for now. You know, typically, you might see, you start off with something, you could start off with something large and, and decay over time, which is a typical strategy, but here we're just setting it to 0.5. Uh, learning rate schedule, here we're saying the scene, uh, setting up a, a learning rate schedule from the learners. We are saying we're going to use stochastic gradient descent on line 9. and line 10, we're going to use this trainer with our model, our network, our loss function, our evaluation metric, and our learner. Okay, Stochastic gradient descent. So this 10 defines our training regimen. Right? How are we going to train, build this model? How are we going to learn to map inputs to outputs? All right. So, uh, in the block five here, I am just concatenating these things. I'm, I'm generating random data each time, right? As opposed to having a fixed data set, which we'll see in a, a few minutes. And I'm building a, a Y vectors where each, each row in the, in the uh, Y matrix has two columns, one for the positive class and one for the negative class, and only one of them will be one, the other will be zero, right? So that's what those lines do. And then we call train or train mini batch. That's essentially what we're doing here. We're saying for 100 epochs, line two, call train, on, train mini batch with that data set that we generate each time. Okay? And here is us looking at the loss reduction. It starts off at 0.7, uh, and it goes down to, log loss goes down to 0.2, and our error starts off on uh, mini batch zero, our error is 0.5, but by the end of mini batch 48, our error, classification error, is zero. So how would, how would such a thing work with the sigmoids, right? 
So here is me printing the, the weights out from the uh, hidden and output layers. Here is me printing the actual features that were derived from the hidden layer. Gesundheit. So the uh, input matrix times that weight matrix for that hidden layer, those two hidden layer neurons, two by two matrix, gives us the uh, uh, output, fe the, the derived features from the network. And here we see the derived features. It kind of looks like the data is smiling at us, right? Uh, the idea is that we now have a linearly separable surface. So the neural network took our linearly inseparable data and transformed it into a linearly separable problem for us. Okay? And that is the magic of representation learning. All right. Um, we talked about that. Activation functions. We looked at a sigmoid logistic this morning. Uh, hyperbolic tangent is also a super popular. Hyperbolic tangent here is red. Instead of going from zero to one like the blue, the sigmoid function, it goes from uh, uh, negative one to one, but it has a similar shape. Uh, the big one that enabled deep learning, one of the enabling factors, uh, besides the adaptive gradient stuff, right? One of the enabling factors and, and tweaks like root mean square propagation, uh, one of the uh, factors that enabled deep learning was this rectified linear unit. So one of the things that you see about our, our, our hyperbolic tangent and our sigmoid is they have a, a, a property called saturation. Over here on the left and over here on the right, if you make a small change in input, essentially no change in output, saturated, okay? Oh, whereas not true for the rectified linear unit, <laughs> which turns out to be a big deal. Um, okay, so for the rest of the tutorial, I'm going to go through examples of Keras. Uh, why Keras? Because it works with CNTK, so C, uh, Keras is on top of CNTK, and we didn't find results for CNTK in the books. There is a free book online for CNTK, However, um, it hasn't been updated in, in a good bit of time. And I would think that um, maybe, maybe on Amazon.com we can fix this problem with the, hopefully you'll go forth and write CNTK books, who knows. Uh, <clears throat> but in the meantime, there are Keras books, right? This book and this book. Uh, this book here, The Deep Learning with Python by this Francois Chal Chalet guy, I recommend that, right? From an applied perspective, forget the math, don't, don't, don't get too bogged down in all the little, little symbols that we just went through. Uh, I highly recommend this book. All right, so installation of Keras is also simple. This as was uh, CNTK. We cloned the, the Keras repository, get repository, change directed to Keras, Python setup install, literally copied and pasted these from the slides into my uh, window and everything worked. Uh, export Keras back end uh, equals CNTK. You should add this to dot bash RC. Okay. So that it uh, updates the back end to use CNTK every time. Other, other back ends that you might, might consider using. Uh, Tensor, TensorFlow from uh, Google or Theano from uh, University of Montreal. Okay. These are alternatives. But we're all about the CNTK this morning. All right. Same CD exa uh, examples. Python, MNIST, MLP, just to get uh, up and running and have it do something for you, right? All right, so documentation for Keras you can find here. And uh, this book, Deep Learning with Keras, the first book that I didn't uh, double star or whatever, it is also a reasonable book. And this guy, mm, they're, they're nice. They're nice little examples where he has a validation data set. So for example, in the networks, you can ask, how many layers should I have in my network? How many nodes should be in each layer of this deep learning model, right? These are, these are uh, architecture questions that you have to wrestle with. All right, so how can we choose? Well, we use a separate holdout validation data set, right? And say, all right, so what if we have 64 nodes in, our, in one layer? What do we get for a result? What if we have 128 nodes in two layers? What do we get for a result? And you're bouncing this against the validation data to say, which performed better? Uh, so this guy was kind of more, it seems, I had the impression that he's a little more careful with that. So they're, they're kind of nice examples. Plus he has um, 
Uh, this Jan Lacuz guy's uh, uh, Len uh, Lynette. I highly recommend that you, you click on this link, the, the Lynette link. So this is from a guy named Jan Lacuz. He is, uh, I guess, in charge of uh, AI at Facebook. He is the guy who came up, I, I, I'm attributing to the, the success of convolutional neural networks to this guy and his application of it to this MNIST data problem. Uh, MNIST stands for Modified National Institutes of Standards and Technology Dataset. And the idea is that somebody has already segmented or drawn uh, boundary, bounding boxes around handwritten characters for us. The Postal Service was, US Postal Service was interested in uh, automated routing of letters and they needed to do handwritten recognition of the zip codes to figure out, hey, what city are we sending this to, right? What, what uh, uh, post office? So if I look at a matrix, the pixels here from the matrix are values between 0 and 255. And I think you can probably hallucinate that there's a 3 in there, right? So we have larger, larger values along here, <coughs> which indicate places where somebody has uh, 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 put ink on our uh, background. All right, so from the MNIST data, there's a, a boatload of tutorials here. First one is logistic regression. Here I am importing stuff. This is similar to CNTK, right? Uh, Keras actually comes with a bunch of data sets, which is really nice. Actually, it doesn't come with the data sets, but when you try to invoke it, you say load data set, it will go out and fetch the data set from the internet for you. So you should have an internet connection when you do such a thing. Everything that I downloaded here today, I think is less than one gigabyte total, okay? The word embedding is kind of kind of uh, put us uh, kind, of, kind of way on our budget there. I'll come to that in a minute. All right, so models, sequential model. This is a feed forward network, one layer after the other. Uh, we're gonna have a dense layer and an activation, uh, use some activation stuff. Uh, stochastic gradient descent is what we're gonna use for this first go round. And we're gonna have some, I don't think he uses utilities here, but maybe he does, I don't know. Oh yeah, he does. He, he uses it to do one hot encoding for the, the class labels. So our class labels here are the digits zero through nine, right? So to get an output matrix, so the input matrix is those pixel values, right? Arrays of those two-dimensional arrays of those pixel values. The output will have, uh, let's say it's a three. So a zero for the zero, a zero for the one, a zero for the two, a one for the three, you get the idea. And then uh, a zero is for the other five digits. So this is one row that says, aha, the first output is a three, okay? <clears throat> so that's what he's using MP utils for here. All right, uh, I set a seed for repeatability. The guy from the uh, Deep Learning with Keras actually uses that. Number of epochs, 200. Batch size, 128. Verbose just says, uh, send stuff to the out screen for me. Number of classes is 10 because that's the number of uh, digits. Optimizer, we're gonna use to start off with stochastic gradient descent. Number of hidden nodes, 128. So this is, um, Number of weights, huh. I don't think so. I think that uh, I copied this, literally I copied this. So the number of hidden nodes, you wouldn't have that for logistic regression, okay? For logistic regression, we're just gonna have a weight for each of the inputs, right? Just X, X transpose times that weight vector gives us some output. And we're gonna have 10, 10 nodes one for each of our uh, classes. All right, um, but that's for logistic regression. So, oops, maybe it's a suggestion for the author there. MNIST load data, again, this will fe fetch the data off the internet for us. Reshaped, 784. So they start out, this is a 28 by 28 matrix. If we reshape it into one big long vector, one row after the other, it is uh, 28 times 28 is 70, 784. All right, so 
we have 784. This will carry us through for uh, mul this in mul multi logistic regression and multi layer perceptron when it comes to convolutional neural networks, will be a little bit different. Uh, so, we reshape the, the uh, two dimensional pixel matrices into one dimensional arrays for feature inputs. Outputs are those um, down here. Block four, eight, nine, ten. Outputs are the one hot encoding of the class labels. Here we have normalization. Here we're dividing by 255. This is kind of the equivalent of taking domain knowledge and saying, you know what? Uh, we say x sub i, some input value, minus zero, that's the minimum possible value, over 255, that's the, excuse me, 255, the maximum possible pixel value, minus zero. Uh, I can scratch out the minus zeros here. So I'm just dividing the values by 255 to get it numbers between zero and one. So normalization is a typical uh, strategy. Uh, a lot, so min-max normalization is popular, as you see here, right? So this is minus min, this is max, this is min. So is uh, subtracting off the mean and dividing by the standard deviation. In fact, not only can you normalize the inputs to your initial uh, 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 data, for your initial data, for example, the pixel values, you could also normalize the features that are derived in intermediate layers, and they refer to this as batch normalization. All right. Uh, here we're building in block five here. We're building a model. Line four, declare a sequential model. Line five, I'm adding a dense layer based on the number of classes, so there'll be 10 nodes, one, one output node for each class. And our activation function is going to be softmax, that e to the x over the sum of e to the x's uh, for each of our classes. You can think of them as log odds weights for each of the classes that's, that's keeping track of via the magic, again, of stochastic gradient descent. Here is us uh, printing a model summary, which gives us an idea of the number of weights. Here is us compiling the model, which essentially is us telling it, here's the optimizer to use, here's the metrics I'd like you to keep track of, here's the loss function that you're using to optimize for. History, uh, we're just uh, recording the history from output from this uh, model fitting process. We feed it the uh, train vectors and the test vectors. We say batch size is some small number of observations, and number of epochs is the number of training epochs to carry out. And the validation split, we're going to use 20% of the training data for uh, holdout, for validation, for tuning in things like, hey, what if we uh, um, added a layer to the network? What if we uh, changed how the, the network activation function? All right. So here we see we, uh, our model has, our model summary says there are 7,850 7, parameters. That is uh, 784 plus one for the bias times 10. That's how they get 7,850. All right, so the thing for logistic regression, it thinks it's going to make a bunch of linear models for the classes. It goes through our 200 epochs, printing out loss functions. The first pair of loss and accuracy values is for the training data. The second pair is for the holdout validation data. And we see that we're getting into the 90s in terms of accuracy, okay? So our validation accuracy at the end is 0.9238. And our test accuracy on the holdout test data, so the data set split up into 60,000 training data and uh, 10,000 test data. So on the 10,000 holdout test examples, we get 92.25% uh, uh, accuracy on class labels for the holdout test images. That is logistic regression. Multi-layer perceptron, same kind of thing, except we're going to define the network slightly differently. Here, it's a sequential model, feed-forward model again. We're adding a dense layer with uh, some number of hidden nodes. I think we said 128, right? Looks like he just copied and pasted from the previous thing. Uh, rectified linear unit is our activation function as opposed to the sigmoid. Um, another dense layer 
of 128 uh, activation functions. So it has two hidden layers. So this is our first deep learning network. Uh, so it can have features built upon top of features. This is uh, the essence of deep, deep learning. Some of these people, uh, again, have w uh, networks with well over 100 layers, but those take a good bit of time to train. All right, so, uh, and then the final, so there's three layers here, essentially three layers. First is a uh, hidden layer, 128 nodes with rectified linear units. Second hidden layer, uh, again hidden, 128 written nodes, rectified linear units, and then uh, 10 output classes. This is the number of parameters that you get for each of these things. And the accuracy went from 92.25 to 94.49. So MLP bought us a little. Here, dropout says, so one method of regularization is uh, adding that weight penalty, right? Doing the weight decay that we talked about earlier. You can use either the, the sum of absolute weights, an L1 regularization term, or the sum of uh, uh, squared weights, an L2 regularization term for, for that. An alternative method to help prevent overfitting is dropout. So here, same multilayer perceptron, except we've added a couple of dropout layers after each of the uh, uh, feature layers. And what the dropout layer does is it randomly selects some, set, some subset of the features and zeroes them out during training. Okay? When it does that, it's going to zero out some proportion of them, typically a, a range from 10% to 50%, something like this. Your mileage may vary. And uh, when it zeroes those out, it's going to have to increase, uh, it's going to simultaneously increase the values of the other, other uh, outputs from that hidden layer so that it can compensate because while we're dropping out at training time so it doesn't overfit the training data, we do not drop out at test time. <laughs> Okay, um, all right, so we have add dropout, and we go from, we go from 94.49 to 97.78. So now we're actually doing better than K-nearest neighbor on this, uh, data if you're familiar with k nearest neighbor. All right, so that helped out a good bit. Uh, the next thing, root mean square propagation. So this previous version had 250 epochs. That's a lot of epochs. After 20 epochs, 20 iterations through the data, through mini batch, our accuracy was at 0.94. Well, with root mean square propagation, again, this is about uh, paying attention, adaptive gradient method where we're normalizing gradients or in, uh, during updates. Only 20 iterations, and we get a similar comparable accuracy, okay? We're able to get to the answer faster, and that's the point. So stochastic gradient descent, it's a variant of stochastic gradient descent, but it's not exactly the same thing, just so you know. All right, uh, the next one, Finally, our convolutional neural network. All right, so, I'll tell you what. Well, our convolutional neural network, what we're taking is, we're going to take a filter, call it a kernel here on this picture I ripped off from, from this place. <laughs> Everything here was stolen from somewhere else. Almost everything here was stolen from somewhere else. Um, all, the, all the good stuff belongs to these people. All the bad stuff belongs to me. Okay. Uh, this kernel, what we're doing is a dot product of the, uh, with the elements that are matched to this kernel and putting the result in the center. Okay? So we're rolling, rolling this filter around uh, our matrix. And we're, so, for example, a filter might look like this. And what this says is, we're rolling this filter around saying, did you see a, 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 a line with a positive slope, right? Did you see this diagonal line? Did you see it, did you see it, did you see it? And we're just moving it one step at a time across our image and then down, okay? So we're creating a new output response map for this stuff. 
So the output response map quantifies the filter response to locations within the image. I am going to go ahead and show you this picture because I think it's kind of cool. I was right about the Wi-Fi thing. So this is Jan Lacaz's uh, uh, Lynette, right? So this is his convolutional neural network. He has five layers. He has a convolution layer one, three, and five. And here it's showing the response maps, okay, that he, that he gets uh, for this, these convolutions. And here, here are the outputs over here. Uh, it's showing the input here, and it's showing the answers up here. It's kind of cool to see what, what kinds of things it highlights as it goes through processing. To define such a thing, in terms of Keras on top of CNTK, I'm just going to roll to the important part. Uh, we are no longer reshaping the data, number one. Uh, there is this little bit in this guy's code from Deep Learning with Keras where he says, if this is a, a image data format is channels first, uh, reshape the data, okay? 12 th through 14. 12 through 14 are something you might see for Theano backend. For uh, CNTK backend, you will not. So we're gonna actually do 16 through 18. We're not, we're not reshaping it to one big vector. We're, we're gonna keep the two-dimensional matrix for the com convolution purposes here. So let's roll to the part where it actually defines the convolution. It's a feed forward network. We have a convolutional layer with a three by three kernel. So we're essentially learning what features are important, right? What kinds of, what kinds of things should we look for to distinguish a seven from a three, right? So maybe a diagonal line actually has something to do with that. So we add the first convolutional layer. He adds a second convolutional layer immediately after that. And that's because we're using Francois Cholet's code. He is very cool in as much as he's showing you some of the latest and greatest stuff. And sometimes that might be a little bit harder to follow, but hey, it is what it is. He adds another, uh, so the first convolutional layer consists of 32 filters, 32 little masks, separate masks, of size three by three. The second convolutional layer consists of 64 filters, also three by three. And that is uh, kind of typical, but normally what you see between the convolution layers is this max pooling. So what we can say, so let's say our response map looks like this. <clears throat> so now we can use this two by two thing and say, all right, what was the largest max pool says for this two by two uh, uh, a region, what was the max response you saw for a diagonal line here? All right, let's, let's make that element one in this new matrix, but it'll be smaller. It'll be half the size, in fact, because the strides are two. By the stride, stride equal two, I mean we take this filter, instead of moving it over one position, we move it over two positions to do the next one. So that's why we see down here, we see 24 by 24 images. The reason why we see, uh, okay, so the first convolution filter drops off the edges because that three by three filter, he's saying let's, let's ignore uh, the upper corner. So it's getting rid of uh, a row and a column from each, each end of the, the matrix, right? So our 28 by 28 becomes 26 by 26 when we do the convolution. When we do the next convolution, 26 by 26 becomes 24 by 24. And then uh, when we do the max pooling, that two by two, it halves the size of our image, 12, 12 by 12, okay? All right, so he then adds a dropout layer, 25% dropout. He flattens the data so that it's just one big happy vector for a dense layer of rectified linear units, adds dropout of 50%, so 50% of the features there randomly drop to zero. And then he rolls it through a, a, a dense uh, softmax output layer. All right, so 
This is, um, if you wanted to count up how to, I, I type in model summary here and it tells us about the number of parameters and the output shape down here in the little uh, uh, text below. If you wanted to figure out how you get the parameter counts, I give an examples, examples here. It's in, examples in the notebook. I probably won't go over too much more here today, but uh, so in the first case, uh, 32, let's say line 14. Let's do a description of one of them for, for posterity's sake. There are 32 filters. There is one input channel because it's just black or white for the MNIST data. Won't always be true. And in just a second, we'll see red, green, blue. So it could be three channels, one for red, one for green, one for blue pixels. Get the idea. Uh, three by three is the size of the filter. So there's 32 of those filters for one input channel. And there's a bias, one bias. So this, is the, this thing in parentheses is the size of the dot product that represents each element in the uh, output response map, okay? We're learning weights to say, did you see this? Did you see this? Did you see this? These for, for these different kinds of features, diagonal lines, horizontal lines, vertical lines, you get the idea. And then we can compose those features to make up uh, uh, higher level abstractions like cat ears. All right, so in this case, we went from 97% uh, to over 99%, test accuracy 9901 which is kind of interesting. I'll just mention this in passing. He says he gets, gets up to 99.25. Too bad we don't see that. The reason why we don't see that, because there's variance, right? So the, the reason we don't see that is because uh, Francois doesn't set seeds. <laughs> so your mileage may vary, but it should be close. It should be really close. All right, um, CIFR 10. Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, Gesundheit, uh, we have 10 classes of data and we have, instead of 28 by 28 grayscale pictures, we have 32 by 32 color pictures. So it's 32 by 32 by three, right? One for red, one for green, one for blue. <clears throat> so the, these are examples of pictures from the, the CIFR 10 data set. Um, all right, 10 classes. Go to the place where we set up the network. Root mean square propagation is probably a good default learning method for, for this stuff. Uh, okay, so of course your mileage may vary. Uh, padding equals same just says, you know what? I want the upper left hand corner, uh, for example, just uh, zeros for everything that doesn't actually match in the filter onto a valid uh, uh, pixel. So convolution 2D, uh, convolution 3x3, three three, rectified linear unit activation for the convolution as opposed to uh, uh, just the dot product. Uh, 32, three by, another 32 3x3 three three, uh, convolution with rectified linear units, max pooling 2D, uh, size 2x2 two two max pooling, dropout 25%. That is the first block, the second dot block. Convolution, 64 of those, three by three filters. Another layer of 64 by three, uh, 64 three by three filters, rectified linear units, max pulling of 2D. We flatten out, uh, we get a, a, a uh, layer of uh, rectified linear unit activation functions, dropout of 50%. And finally, a dense layer of uh, softmax. Softmax for the 10 classes, again, there's a summary of parameters. That's how we derive the parameters. And the cool part about this one, one of the things, okay, so one of the things that uh, the Neural Information Processing System people, right, the NIP, people who attend the NIPS conference, one of the things they notice, you know, people try to pay attention. Everybody tries to pay attention to everybody else's work, right? The gradient boost, boosting people versus the neural nets people. The neural nets people glommed on to the idea of random subspace projection, right? Like random forest. Like, can use dropout. Um, their idea of using distortions, I haven't seen make it into other tools like gradient boosting, for example. But so here, uh, just highlighting lines 18 through 21, <coughs> this, is, uh, this, this data generator specifies how to manipulate the data, how to distort the data to get additional training examples to try to make us just slightly more robust. So we can shift along the horizontal axis. 
We can shift along the uh, vertical axis, you know, so your picture, right, P your, your picture of your airplane moves up or down or sideways, that kind of thing. Uh, you can do a horizontal flip. You could do a vertical flip, but it might not make sense anymore, right? Like, up, why would you have an upside down picture of a plane? Of course, you could try to feed an upside down picture just to see if your image recognition, Im image recognition engine still recognizes it. Might get some interesting results there. Uh, so the cool, one of the cool tricks here is he's using a data generator to uh, help make the, the model more, slightly more robust. After 30 epochs, which is like, um, well, I'm going to say uh, two-thirds of uh, 40 seconds per epoch, per epoch uh, times 30, what, 20 minutes? After 20 minutes, we're getting like 75% accuracy. I think state-of-the-art on um, uh, CIFAR is probably... 90s, 95, 96, something like this. Uh, one of the things you could do, you can use pre-trained models. So one of the models that comes with Keras is something called a VGG16 model. Uh, Oxford Visual Geometry Group 16-layer network uh, built for ImageNet. ImageNet has over a million uh, uh, pictures. Okay, it's one. Uh, the, okay, so I think by '98, convolutional neural networks were kind of well established, but they didn't get become really super popular until uh, the 2010s, when they were used for this ImageNet large-scale uh, visual recognition challenge competition, <coughs> and they made a significant decrease in error. All right, so uh, Oxford used this ImageNet, which is over a million images, takes a while to process, especially for 16-layer network. Uh, but they give you the pre-trained features. The ImageNet data looks like the CIFAR data. In fact, in uh, Francois Chollet's uh, book, The Deep Learning with Python, one of the things he goes over is he, he takes a Kaggle competition data Kaggle.com, it's um, like data science competitions, right? And they did some image recognition challenge where you're supposed to distinguish something from something else. I'm going to say dogs and cats. I, I, I don't remember. But uh, you were only given a few thousand images. <sighs> but those ImageNet people have over a million images, right? So like the, the kinds of things to recognize, the, and, and, and that data contains dogs and cats, OK? So they use this pre-trained data just to to output those features. Remember when we looked at, first looked at the multilayer perceptron and we turned the, the uh, non-linearly separable data into a smiley face that so we could linearly separate the data? That was based on features derived from that hidden layer. All right, so we're using this pre-trained network to generate features based on convolution. So it doesn't have to have the same size image. You're just rolling this convolution over, convolution filter over your images. It's the convolution filters that make the big deal that tell you what are distinctive features, right? And then let the, let the following layers that you build custom uh, choose which features are relevant for distinguishing cats from dogs, for example, which are not. All right, um, so that's convolutional neural networks. All right. Text classification. Uh, Reuters multilayer perceptron. I am just going to tell you what that one does. <laughs> uh, Reuters is a news data set. This has a few thousand observations. And essentially what the multilayer perceptron here does is we take the thousand most frequent words and we say, let's say document one has word uh, zero, word two, and word six. So all the rest of these are zeros, okay? So an, an observation then is represented by this vector of ones and zeros, where it's a one if we saw this word in the document, otherwise it's a zero. You can throw that, throw that through a multilayer perceptron and see what it does in text. And this, this notebook actually covers the text processing. And I, I, I tried to spit out things, so I modified it a little, the examples a little. Spit out things so you, you can see the ones and zeros. You can see the words that were used in the original text, that kind of thing. All right, uh, the next one is GLOVE. These are global vectors. 
This is with news groups data. News groups comes from, 20 news group data comes from uh, Usenix. It's like email dist old, old style email distribution list where uh, rec.hockey, rec.sports.hockey was one of the uh, interest groups. Think of it like Reddit, but email, right? All right, uh, so global vectors represent uh, some kind of embedding, a representation of, of words. So here, there's two two big names in word embeddings. It is word to vec and glove, or global vector embeddings. Word to vec embeddings. Essentially, we're taking the representation from some hidden layer of, an, in this case, a skipgram architecture network. The Google, people, folks at Google, took uh, news data and uh, a, a lot of news data and built models where they said the input is a word, we grab a word, and we grab another word from the context within a few words of that word. And the answer, label is, was this word, does this word appear in the context of, the, of, does this word appear in the context of this word? Yes or no? So for a sentence, we can grab all, all the other, uh, you know, based on the this width size of the window we're using for skip grams. We can say, all right, let's grab uh, uh, all the words within two words of the current word. Those are positive class examples. Those were next to each other. And then we can grab random words from the rest of the corpus and say, nope, not this, not this, not this. And the idea is that we're trying to build uh, uh, a representation for those words. And they they had some, some um, oh, there's some, there's some interesting blog posts where they say we can take the king embedding and subtract the um, uh, woman embedding, excuse me, <laughs> man embedding. So we have a vector, a vector, for example, of 300 features from here, from this embedding layer that represent king. We have another vector of 300 features that represent man. If we subtract the man values from the king values, the closest vector that we see is queen. That's kind of interesting, so it's a novel trick. But so we're, we're looking for a, a representation of the word. And then so for uh, glove, glove is the same kind of thing, except they've used matrix factorization, okay? And so here with matrix factorization, we have a co-occurrence matrix of the word and the context words. And then we, it's sort of like um, alternating least squares, right? Where for the um, Netflix prize, where we take and we say, oh, you know what? We've got some latent word features and some latent context features. And this vector times this vector will give you the um, uh, co-occurrence value here, right? So the first, first uh, latent vector for words and the first latent column for uh, the context. This multiplied by this, the dot product of these two, gives you the co-occurrence. That's what we're trying to predict. So we can use this alternating least squares paradigm with gradient descent, something that scales, to build uh, uh, embeddings. Which one is better? Uh, I've heard people go out on a limb and say, oh, glove, glove is more accurate. Glove is more accurate for what? It depends, your mileage may vary, right? You should try it out for your application to see. Uh, so, news groups, uh, this uh, notebook 11 takes the glove representation, loads it up into a Keras layer so that you can predict the word embeddings for any, any given word index, right? It says this. This is turned into uh, word frequency 17. So word frequency 17 selects the uh, embedding layer 17, the, that representation and then it feeds it to a convolutional neural network. So the same way you ran a two-dimensional filter against a, a, um, uh, against a image, you can run a one-dimensional vector against a email, okay? And the question there is, did you see it, did you see it, did you see it? Same question, right? Do you see this pattern? You're trying to learn this pattern through backpropagation, okay? And then you can feed that to a dense layer and feed that out to a um, um, 
softmax layer. I think this one has uh, 46 classes, or excuse me, I'm sorry. The Reuters news groups has 20 or has 46 classes. So for example, earnings, a story about earnings would be an example of a Reuters news article. Um, the news groups has 20. Rec Sports Hockey is an example, and the notebook has, has an example of somebody talking about Wayne Gretzky from the late 90s. All right, so our last little bit is about recurrent neural networks with uh, long short-term memory. So a simple recurrent neural network example. Uh, this is the picture people draw. These are the inputs. They could be, for example, characters. I'm just going to give you my, my interpretation of this wild ML blog post, an example of an interpretation of wild ML blog posts. We have hidden weights for the inputs. We have hidden weights for the previous outputs. For the first, there is no, uh, there is no previous input. For the first, uh, let's say we're doing sentiment classification on uh, uh, internet movie database reviews. Okay? We want to know if it's a positive review or a negative review to keep track. Do people like this movie or not? So our sequence, we start off with the first word in the uh, review. So the, the previous input doesn't exist for the first one, obviously. But as we go, we have a dependency over time between words, right? Uh, so whether we see positive, wor positive words might depend on what we saw previously. You could use this in this particular example for the wild ML blog, where it has multiple outputs, one per each position. You might use this for autocomplete, right? Somebody has typed, typed this stuff, what do we think is most likely to be next, right? For autocomplete purposes. It's like the feed forward network, except we're taking input from the previous time step. For long short term memory, for a simple recurrent neural network, this defines the output layer. Uh, where in the blog, F was the hyperbolic tangent and G was the softmax function. In the case of uh, internet movie databases, we don't need these other outputs. We only need the last output that says, when we get to the end of the row, was this a positive or a negative, negative sentiment? <laughs> All right, so this is, these are the uh, equations driving the outputs for uh, recurrent neural network. The problem is uh, there's two, two types of problems. Uh, exploding gradients, values get really large being propagated, okay? Way to take care of that is clipping. And there is vanishing gradients, values get really, really small. What these folks from uh, 20 years ago came up with, this is the same, net, same node that we saw earlier where it has these two weight matrices. You know what's better than two weight matrices? Eight weight matrices. <laughs> the idea is that we use these uh, gates, input forgetting and output gates. Uh, input gate here, forgetting gate. This is, we added this new cell state. This forgetting gate says, these weights say, should we remember this information from before? The input gate says, to what extent should we pay attention to what's, what's taking place now, what we see now? And this output gate says, what is actually going to be the output of this cell? So the cell state is just going from cell to cell, and this H actually goes to some output like, zoom tight, where like a sigmoid, where it's, we ask the question, is this a positive or a negative sentiment review? And that is the uh, um, big picture of long short-term memory cells. They have examples here. Internet Movie Database example. <laughs> All right. Um, here we're setting up, again, the sequential network, but we're adding this LSTM layer, okay? So we add an LSTM layer. We get uh, 0.8138 for accuracy on this data set. Like 0.88 is the tops, or was the tops when it was published by Stanford earlier. If we use two layers, we say one forward layer, and then side by side, we say one backward layer, propagating backward from the end to the beginning. Bidirectional LSTM, we get 85% uh, accuracy, so we're doing better. Here, this is classic overfitting, actually. Just so you see epochs, as the epochs go up, 
our accuracy on our training data is going up, but our accuracy on our test data is going down. That is the, the hallmark of, of overfitting. But overall, performance went up by using the bidirectional STM versus the uh, uh, unidirectional LSTM. And then this last one, essentially all we're doing We're using embeddings with uh, global average pooling. So all the words that we see, we just average them and feed that to a dense sigmoid activation layer with this adaptive moments. Uh, it's a different type, you know, like there's, R, there's stochastic gradient in it, there's RMS prop, uh, uh, root mean square propagation. There's also adaptive moments. It uses both RMS prop and uh, a momentum term to avoid the local minima. <coughs> uh, we use these together. It's a little bit simpler, it gets better. That is um, kind of kind of round state of the art performance for that, that data set. All right, and there's like 25,000 reviews and train, 25,000 reviews and tests. So, what kinds of things do we go over? Uh, brief intro to uh, deep learning and CNTK. Setting up an Azure VM with the GPU and installing GPU driver CNTK and Keras. Then we looked at a bunch of examples, including both feed forward and recurrent neural networks, including gradient descent, back propagation, multi layer uh, perceptron with CNTK, MNIST logistic regression, multi layer perceptron with dropout and uh, RMS propagation for the learning. Also, a convolutional neural networks for both MNIST and CIFAR 10. And then we talked about MLPs and CNNs for text classification. And we looked briefly at an LSTM and uh, uh, fast text for internet movie database reviews. There are some CNTK references, along with a pointer to Stack Overflow help page. Uh, other stuff to check out, uh, baby. You capitalize the A and the I because it's somebody's artificial intelligence baby. It's a kind of cool example of uh, uh, question answering, reading, for, uh, reading comprehension. There is a speech recognition example and that comes with um, CNTK here with the AN4 database from Carnegie Mellon. And for Kaggle competitions, I would encourage you to definitely participate and use ensembling of different models, right? Use a shallow, deep, shallow wide model. Add to the ensemble a uh, deep, narrow model, that kind of thing to get some diversity to uh, help boost you to the top of the leaderboard. And that's it.